that the Lord bless me to bless me to have the ability to preach. He gives me this this thing where I can go to him and I say, Lord, what do you want me to preach? And this Sunday, he's given me this message that will give me the scripture that's very, very familiar to us today. You let me know that when I preach scriptures, that there's not just one meaning to scriptures. There could be thousands of meanings for one scripture. That's how vast and how great our God is and how, how awesome he is in scriptures. And I said, Lord, Jesus, you've given me this scripture before. And I said, Lord, when you put this together for me, I wanted to make sure that it interlocks with the other messages. And the Lord blessed me to have this message to interlock with some other messages I've had in the past couple of weeks. And it's gone before that. I said, Lord, I thank you. Because people need what the Lord says. And I'm so grateful that I can give this message to you this morning. If you're looking at this on the internet, I know this is going out and we're filming right now. I pray that God will keep everyone outside these four walls. And we are Glad Tidings Church of God, I mean, Glad Tidings Assembly of God here. And I'm grateful that the Lord bless us to be who we are. If you have any, if you have any type of um, <clears throat> testimonies you want to give to us, send it to us. Let us know how you feel about this church. And how you feel about the messages and if the Lord's blessed you. I'm grateful that this message, these, these, this can go out to the world. And I'm grateful today. So I'm very, very, uh, very, very, very grateful that the Lord can do that. The first thing I want to let you know that we can trust and fear the Almighty God. And that's what we're looking at today. Trusting and fearing the Almighty God. And we are in Psalms 34, verses 1 through 5. I want you to take this home. I want you to use this for the rest of the year, since it's still the beginning of the year. We're still in January. And I want you to keep this in your hearts. Psalms 34, 1 through 5. It's a familiar scripture to all of us, and it should be. And it's an encouraging scripture. And I said, Lord, I've read this. I've, I've preached about this before, but I said... But he said, you haven't preached it like this before. I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Psalms 34, 1 through 5. It says this. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. Dear Jesus, we love you and praise you for this time. Thank you for letting me see this message, Lord. This is not my message, but this is your message to your people. I pray for my strength. I pray for my voice. I pray that you bless me, Lord Jesus, to give it the way you want it to give. I don't preach in my own strength, Lord, but I preach in yours. And I thank you, Father, for the people in this wonderful house. And I thank you for those who are outside of this house listening on the Internet today. And I pray that you bless them and encourage them today. Because this message is not supposed to stay in these four walls. They go out outside of these four walls. And however someone is looking at this today, bless them to know that they can trust and fear you, God, in your precious name. Everyone in the house, say amen. Amen. In this passage today, we're talking about King David. David. I love love preaching out of the Psalms when the Lord blessed me to do that. David the shepherd hadn't been anointed king by the prophet Samuel. And though Saul still 
sat on the throne of Israel, the Lord has promised David that one day he was going to be king of Israel. Now, the first time Saul meets David when, was when the Philistine Goliath challenged Israel to a duel, to a war, to a fight. David, filled with faith and the promise of God, steps out on the battlefield, carrying only a sling and five stones. 1 Samuel 17 and 40 says, Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch, which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And you know, and you know how all that ended. You know how that ended. Goliath ends up lying on the ground. And to turn injury into insult, David cuts off Goliath's head with his own sword. Now, now, although King Saul threatened David's life and, and, and David, and David, driven with fear, began to run. He ran first to all to the, wait, first, first of all, he ran to the tabernacle. I should put it like that. He ran to the tabernacle first, and he was hungry. This is after he had been running for a while. He was hungry, and, 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 and he was shaking, and David begged for bread. The only bread that was there was to show bread in the temple, the holy dedicated bread in the house of God. And so this should have been a sign that David, that David was protected. This should have been a sign that, that God was looking after him. Let me tell you something, folks. The Lord is always looking out for his children. Always. God always provides bread to his people. The Lord had promised David that he would be the next king of Israel. Okay? The Lord's prophet, Samuel, had anointed him. David was as safe in the midst of the, his enemies as he was in the tabernacle before the high priest. Now, now that can be hard for some people who are watching this today, that you are safe in the middle of your enemies, that's a hard thing to take. But with the Lord on your side, you are safe. As David, he, as he prepared to leave the tabernacle, his belly was filled with holy bread. David asked the high priest if he had any weapon that he could use to protect himself. Verse Samuel 21 and 9 says, So the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah. He says, There it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that out here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Now, Here's one thing. David should have remembered the faithfulness of God as he looked at Goliath's sword. When David in faith went to fight Goliath, he refused to wear Saul's armor because it was oversized and unusable. This time, David forgot about God, which we folks, we cannot do. And what he did, he feared man. Now he wants an oversized, impossible to use sword to protect himself. There is none like that. Give it to me, he says. See, this sword was built for a man nearly 10 feet tall. David was not nearly six, or oh, was a little bit over six feet, maybe. Probably not close to six feet, maybe a little bit more. But this sword was made for a man who was 10 feet tall. So here he is taking a sword that's dragging behind him. How is he going to get somebody, how are you going to kill somebody like that? He can't even pick up the sword. He's dragging it behind him. But he takes it anyway. So he continues running. Here comes the errors and mistakes. 
Now David decides to run to Abimelech of Gath, a man called Asius. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6, he says, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. See, folks, when you focus and put your trust in man or everything else around you and not in the faithfulness of God, you bring a curse on yourself. David had cursed himself by his actions. Here it is. He's been running scared instead of running to God. See, when he went after Goliath, his first inclination was, God, protect me. God, keep me in your hands. Now, he's depending on an oversized sword, and he's depending on man. See, you can imagine what he's looking like. He's running. He, he's running. He, he, he hasn't had a bath in days. He's been hiding in caves, in holes in the ground. His hair is a mess. He has scratches and bruises all over him. He probably smells like a hundred pigs in mud. And he's probably jumping. He's probably shaking, wide-eyed, and he's frightened. And let me tell you something. Some of you maybe, who may be looking at this today might be in the same condition. See, when Abimelech's guards see David, they say in 1 Samuel 21, 11, he says, And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another and dance and saying, Saul is slain his thousands, David his ten thousands? Suddenly, and here, and here we go, suddenly David was frightened. Kings of that day were subject to assassination. So they maintained their reign by maintaining their appearance. Folks, David didn't look like a king. He didn't act like a king. He wasn't regal like a king. See, if you look weak, you could be easily overthrown. No one wants to follow a weak king. Abimelech's guards had heard through the grapevine that the day that King David was, next, uh, was the next great warrior, a man who was greater than the great King Saul. They heard that David had overthrown Saul, who, who, he, but he was filthy, he was ragged, he was scared, he looked scared. And again, dragging a sword that was too big for him. A sword that was probably as big as he was. And he's trying to use that to protect himself. He says, surely this couldn't be the great mighty David. Why was David now frightened before Bimlach? David realized that he had made a serious mistake. What did he do? We now see an explanation and theme in Psalm 34. This is what he wrote in this psalm. 1 Samuel 21, 13 and 15 says, David, so he changed his behavior before them. He pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down on his beard. He looked like a sight. Then Achan said to his servants, look, you see, this man's insane. Why have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David learned a big lesson that day. The lesson was that we need, we need to learn is this. You will never truly live until you learn to live in the Lord. And through the Lord. Let God live for you and live through you. Amen. David learned it that day. A child of God must learn to trust and have faith in the promises of God. He must learn to trust God and God alone. 
after David shamefacedly wrote the superscription before the scripture. He didn't what he wrote in this scripture. When he wrote the scripture, he said, A psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. That's what you see first when you read the scripture. But then he followed it with the statement, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's Psalms 34 and 1. See, see when fear or, or fearful situations come, David tells us that the first lesson he learned was to avoid Abimelech or the flesh and bless the Lord at all times. Folks, I'm learning every day that we must catch ourselves and we must fear God first. Amen. <laughs> the word bless means that this is a deliberate, a thoughtful, premeditated, on purpose, and intensive action. When the dark times come in, and, 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 and come in your life, the first thing David said is to do is to worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. See, see we, need to, we need to intentionally and, and, and with all deliberateness kneel before him and praise him for what he's doing in your life and what he's going to do in your life. I praise God what he's going to do in his church. I'm already thankful. I'm praising him in advance. Too many people try to fix the problem themselves. And when they've messed it all up, they go to God crying with a desperate prayer. When they should have gone to the almighty God in the first place. Amen. I know that circumstances and situations can be bad. They can be rough. And they can be, and, and they can be out of control sometimes. But God has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. So what you need to do right now is just to stop and praise the Lord and bless him. Because if we are children of the king, <laughs> we are going to come out victorious. And again, as I was reading about David and his situation and how he was running down, when he's running from Saul and, and going through these trials, I know that he got bruised, he, he, he got bumped, and, and he got cut along the way, and not just physically, but he got bruised and cut emotionally and mentally, and those bruises and cuts turn into scars. You know, same with us here. We get bruised and, and we get cut along the way. And I know, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of products out there. There's a lot of things and solves and, and salves and stuff like that that can take scars off our bodies. But there are some scars that are so deep that will stay. But let me tell you something. Those scars are proof that God heals. <sighs> The scars let us know that we are still here. And that's why I can say that I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Psalm 34, 7 and 8 says this. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. And he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusteth in him. Here's what taste means. Taste means to in intimately experience and put something on the tongue and swallow it. God wants you to intimately experience him. When the woman at the well came to Jesus, she told him that we worship in the mountains. But Jesus told her that the hour is coming when the true worshipers of God won't need to worship him in the mountains, but that they can worship him wherever and whenever they want to. Because here's what it is. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The only way I can experience God intimately is through the Holy Spirit. I preached about that last week. God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to trust and have faith in him. 
in his power and not in any man or flesh. See the, see, the thing is, the greatest enemy of all is ourself. It is ourself. I can say I can trust, I can trust Bob, but I can't do it if flesh is saying you trust him. Flesh is your greatest enemy. Do not trust in flesh. Let me tell you, our God has the power to do the impossible and the unthinkable and the unmatchable. Romans 5, 8 through 10 says, but God demonstrates his power, his own love toward us again. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more. Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Let me ask you something. Church, those may be looking to the outside of church, do you honestly think that God saved you to throw you away? No, he didn't. You need to see the broader and the extensive plan of God in your life. Listen to something here. Thank you, Jesus. When God anointed David as next king, David came from the field smelling like dirty, dirty sheep. David was safe and secure there because God had a plan for David's life. He's got a plan for you. Jeremiah says he knows the plans that he has for you. No man can take David. No one could ever take him. Certainly Saul had no power over David either. But David, through fear, mm -hmm, through fear, he allowed a dead man to rule over him. I want you to realize something here. You have not been anointed by Samuel by a human being, but that the greater one, our God, <laughs> the great almighty God has anointed you. Hmm. Revelations 1 and 6 tells us this. He says that we have been made kings and priests unto God. Just like Saul had, to, had no hold or power over David, Satan has no hold over you. Greater is he who is in you than he who was in the world. You are kings and priests unto God and have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's why we sing that song today. And you are precious and holy because of what Christ paid for you on that cross, on that tree. He paid the price for us. You should feel like David when he said, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that. <laughs> Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all, 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 all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 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 Listen, folks, you got a right to praise him. Come on, I feel like a little praise this morning. Do me a favor, just give God a little praise this morning. Lord, we thank you. I thank you, Lord. I can bless your name even in the midst of, of danger. We can bless your name this morning, God. We thank you this morning because you are awesome and great. You're awesome. You're wonderful. Thank you. And, 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 and then David says next here, he says, 34, Psalms 34 and to him, he says, My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. 
the humble shall hear of it and be glad. See, see, do not just bless the Lord in the midst of the trial, but boast in the Lord. Every chance you get, you should brag about God. See, 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 what do my family and friends think about me boasting about God and living for him? I say, well, what, what does God think? What do the dear people in my life think about me depending and trusting in God and not on them? And I have to think that they don't have the power to send me to heaven or hell either. Right. Amen. Whose report are you going to believe? I'm going to believe in the report of the Lord. Because I can boast in the Lord's report and his track record. Amen. He's the one who wakes me up and opens my eyes. Amen. Gives me the activity of my limbs every day. What have you done for me lately? You can boast, boast that he took you from a miry pit one day and saved your soul and put your feet on higher ground. Anybody, can anybody attest of that? No. Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah! He took 39 stripes from a cat and nine tails that tore his body into shreds. He did it for me. He died and went to hell for me. And he fought for me and came back and rose from the dead for me. What have you done for me? The Hebrew word for boast is a leo. It means to shine forth and to bring on to boast. David tells his soul to boast in the Lord. When trials come into your life, instead of having a pity party, we need to boast in the Lord. I have come too far to let anything or any circumstance in my life dictate to me because of my status or my relationship with God. I won't do that. We need to learn to magnify God. Make him bigger than our problems and circumstances because he is. He's our most sovereign God. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God, just as certainly as David belonged to God. You need to know that you have a destiny and a calling. God did not shed his blood of his precious son to purchase you for no reason. He had all kinds of reasons, and one of the main reasons is that he thought that you was worth it, and if it was only that one reason, I'll take it. In fact, that's the main one for me. He thought I was worth it, so he did it. I'll take it. Psalm 34 and 4, 3 says, 34 and 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. At first, it was personal with David. Now it's become so good to David that now he wants everyone to experience God with him. Can I tell you that the enemy's main focus and goal is to keep you in the fear, in fear and to prevent you from praising God with others. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Yes, amen. Folks, I want to tell you, fear God. Fear God. Don't let anyone stop you from praising God, especially where there's freedom and liberty to do so. There are people around this world who have to praise God in secret and underground and in holes, in caves. They have to go elsewhere so they won't be persecuted or killed for praising or God or even the same, the same in the name of Jesus. But I thank God that we live in a country where we have the freedom to say hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah this morning. That we can say praise the Lord. Say praise the Lord with me. Someone can say glory to God. Someone say glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Folks, glory to God. See, we didn't have any type of martial law. We didn't have anyone coming with guns and, 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 and all kinds of threats. Say, if you say that name of Jesus, I'm going to kill you. We can say it any time. Hallelujah. We don't have to worry about that. And I can say glory to God in the highest. And in the same manner, same chapter, Psalms 34 and 22, and the Lord gave me this, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. But then he goes to Psalms 34 and 5, which says, they looked to him and were radiant. They were lightened. 
and their faces were not ashamed. Woo! Woo! The word lightning in the Hebrew is nahar, which means to be cheerful. Come on, smile someone this morning. Come on, be cheerful, be glad. It, to bubble like a stream, to be lifted up in spirit, to shine or to be radiant. You know when someone truly gets saved or delivered by the way they look. You ever seen someone who came in one way and, and came out looking another way? The spirit of the Lord and, and the touch of the Lord can make a person look different. I've told you times when I've seen people come in drunk and stinky and, and, and looking all crazy. When they come up, they look like a different person. In fact, it's not the way they look, it's the way they feel. When you're delivered from something, you have a different look and there's a shine on them. Hallelujah. A smile that they never had before. A gleam in their eyes that they've never had before. Hallelujah. I can think of the story when the man was in the catacombs. When he was there, he was all crazy. But boy, they thought he was different. When the Lord saved them and took him out of the catacombs, they couldn't keep him in chains or anything like that. And, and when Jesus touched him, when the Lord saved them, they didn't recognize him. He went into the, went into the, to, to the town and they didn't know who he was because of what God had did for him. You have a different look and a shine on you when the Lord touches you. Those who look unto Jesus who are saved are all of these verses and these things. First Timothy 1 and 7 says this. For God has given us, not given us the spirit of fear, but the power and of love and a Oh, did you get that? You guys got sound minds this morning? Let me pray for you if you're not. If you're not sound this morning. A lot of people don't have sound minds this morning. But here's that verse again. It says again, he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. When Paul wrote this, a young Timothy was experiencing some great opposition to his message and to his leader. And as a leader, his youth as a young preacher, his associated with Paul and his leadership had come under attack from other people, from other non-believers. Let me let you in some, on something, folks. We're going to be attacked. But here's what Paul did. He urged young Timothy to be bold. When we allow people to intimidate us, we neutralize our effectiveness for God. The power of the Holy Spirit can help us overcome our fear of what some might say or do to us so that we can continue to do God's work. The Bible tells us not to fear the one who can hurt us on earth, but fear the one that can kill the body and the soul. And outside of power... Outside of power and love, in which we must have, he says that we need a sound mind, which is wisdom. Wisdom is to know the right things to do. Wisdom to know that the Holy Spirit is going to lead us in the right direction. And wisdom to use the Holy Spirit as your friend and ally. Remember I preached last Sunday that he is our prayer partner. Remember he's our prayer partner. I'm happy today. I'm almost done. I'm happy today. You know why? Because I know the Lord loves me. He gave his life on Calvary for me. He rose from the grave. And, and because of me and because of all who, I, who, who believe in him, he sits on the right hand of God, the Father, making intercession for us every second of the day. A lot of people don't realize that the Lord is interceding for us every second of the day. God, <laughs> he watches out for us. He watches out for our welfare. You know, I, sometimes I talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive me that. We talk about what they did in life and their deeds. 
You know what? They were in the fire and under attack. They were under attack a lot because of they, what they stood for. Thank you, Jesus. Give me this. Someone needs this this morning. But let me tell you where the safest place they were. The safest place in their lives was when they were in the physical fire. I want you to get that. The safest place was when they were in the physical fire, in the fiery furnace. Why? Because the Lord was standing right with them. The, 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 the king was saying, hey, I thought we threw three people in there. I see four. One that looks like the son of God. When you're in the fire, that's sometimes the safest place because I want that, I want God right near me. I'd rather be in a fire with God than someplace outside of the fire without him. It was the safest place in their life. The Lord is always with you wherever you are in life. And if you proclaim to be the child of God, don't ever forget that fact and that promise. He will never leave you or ever forsake you. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. We sing in that song, Yes, Jesus loves me. It's so simple. But boy, it's one of the truest songs I ever sung in my life. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. I said, wow, how simple that is. But it's one that is the truest facts in life. Because this word of God tells me that Jesus loves me. And I will take this book over any book or ever anything in my life because I know he loves me. And as I end today, you know, if you've been feeling down about things lately or going through some trials that keep you from praising God, I just want to pray for you this morning. If you're just going through, just going through, I want to pray for you. You know, I didn't know what that, what that meaning, what that, that thing was when, they, when the mothers used to say, well, I'm just going, whoops, I know some of you are going through. Anybody ever been through before? <laughs> you've, been, you've been through? And I used to wonder, what is, what is Mother Johnson's, what do, what do you mean by saying she's going through? We're, we're going through. And then as I got older and older and older, I said, I know what you mean by going through now. I want to pray for you if you're going through. If you need to be saved today, I want to pray for you. Because you need to meet them now before you meet them later. If you need a deeper relationship with God, I want to pray for you. You know if you know God. If you're not, you don't, if you know him and you don't. If you're depressed this morning, some of us know some people who are in depression this morning. I want to pray for them. And if you need Jesus today, I want to repeat this after me in the church. And those who are in the house today, I want to pray for those who may be outside of these doors, maybe looking at this, this sermon today. I want to make sure that everyone sees Jesus and go to heaven. Let me tell you, folks, there's a lot of people who are depressed out there. How many know that this morning? There's a lot of people who are wanting to take their own lives this morning. They said every, statistics say that every half hour, Every half hour, someone is taking their life in this country. And let's pray that if some one of those people are looking at this today, that they will get the hope in Jesus Christ and let them know that everything is going to be all right. Let's pray, and I want everyone here to repeat after me in agreement with them. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me and setting my soul free. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And right now, Lord, 
This is my moment. This is the moment. I want to give you my life. To give you my heart. And to give you my soul. I want you to save me, Lord. Save me from my sins and my shame. Forgive me of my sins and my shame. Make me new. Make me your child. I want to be yours. From here on out and the rest of my life, I want to live for you. I want to praise you. I want to give you glory. I want to have faith in you and always have trust in you. I thank you, Father, for forgiving me of my sins and my shame. And right now, Lord, you've given me the love for you because you loved me when you died on the cross just for me. And if I was the only one on earth, you would have died for me and set me free. And now, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for saving me. And now I'm saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give God a hand praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being in the house of God today.